Hi there and welcome to the first webinar in our um, Primary Prevention of Violence Against Women series. Um, I'm Laura James from the Violence Against Women team at the Improvement Service and with me is also Lynn Sharp, Communication Officer at the Improvement Service as well. So I'm very pleased to welcome Kelsey Smith, Programme Officer at Close the Gap, Scotland's expert policy and advocacy organisation working on women's labour market inequality. She leads on Equally Safe at Work, an employer accreditation program that is being piloted in seven local authorities that supports the local implementation of the Equally Safe strategy. And we'll be hearing more about that later on. I'm also pleased to welcome Katie Brown, who's the Violence Against Women Policy Coordinator at COSLA. Katie works to coordinate and support COSLA's joint governance of the Equally Safe strategy with the Scottish Government and to progress local implementation of the Equally Safe delivery plan. As violence against women and girls is a cross-cutting issue, Katie works across all of COSLA's functions and boards. So before we hear from Kelsey and Katie, I'm going to briefly introduce their primary prevention guidance um, and the aims of the webinar. So in 2019, the Improvement Service and Zero Tolerance, in partnership with the National Violence Against Women Network, published primary prevention guidance for local community planning partners, um, and the link to um, that is on the PowerPoint at the moment. The guidance supports local community planning partners who have a key role to play in promoting gender equality and preventing violence against women and girls, both within their own organisations and as members of local strategic partnerships. The guidance helps to ensure that local community planning partners are working in line with the priority to tackle the causes of violence against women and girls and gender inequality as set out in Equally Safe, Scottish Government and COSLA's joint strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls as well as Scottish Government's national outcomes. The guidance will help partners begin to develop effective local strategies and activities to both embed gender equality and prevent violence against women and girls from ever occurring. The Improvement Service and Zero Tolerance, in partnership with the National Violence Against Women Network, are hosting a series of webinars, of which this is the first, to highlight key themes and good practice from the guidance. So today's focus is on the links between primary prevention of violence against women and girls and employment and the workplace. As both Kelsey and Katie will cover today, employers across the public, private and third sectors have a vital role to play in the primary prevention of violence against women and girls and the promotion of gender equality through making changes to policy and practice related to workplace environment and employment. So we'll have time for questions following the presentations from both Kelsey and Katie. Um, please feel free to use the question function on your screens um, to send us questions. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Katie, who will take us through the first part of the webinar. Good morning. Um, my name is Katie Brown. I work at COSLA, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, which is the political voice of local government in Scotland. Our 32 member councils are elected democratically to ensure that local authorities can deliver services across the communities they serve informed by and in accordance with local needs, priorities and aspirations. Councils have a pivotal decision-making and governance role and uh, they hold accountable their authorities planning and delivery of services. These services can be delivered directly by local authorities and through local authorities working both strategically and operationally with other key public sector multi-agency partners, partners and partnerships. Local councils through local authorities work to deliver outcome focused results that positively impact on the lives of people who live in, grow up in, learn in and go to work in the communities that the council serves. The COSLA plan sets out the vision and overall priorities that our members have set. One of the 10 priorities is that everyone should live in a strong, safe and sustainable community. We reach that through tackling poverty and inequalities, protecting the vulnerable and strengthening communities and improving their safety and sustainability. Across our communities, people are facing wide ranging and complex challenges that undermine this vision. The prevalence of violence against women and girls, also known as gender based violence, is a critical issue and it's a challenge right across the world. Violence against women and girls has been identified by the UN as affecting around one in three women and girls worldwide. It says that women and girls experience violence and discrimination in every society, 
simply because of their gender and they are at risk from the moment they are born. Whether at home, on the streets or during war, violence against women and girls is a human rights violation of pandemic proportions that takes place in public and private spaces and that manifests itself in a wide range of physical, sexual and psychological forms. It is both a cause and a consequence of women's ongoing unequal status in society. This issue is not only devastating for survivors of violence and their families, but also entails significant social and economic costs. So, in Scotland, the Scottish Government and COSLA, along with key expert and associated public sector organisations, have determined that everyone in Scotland should be equally safe and that violence against women and girls must be prevented and eradicated. A gendered analysis helps to make sense of the scale and impact of violence against women. Through the application of this lens, we learn that while men may be victims of violence and abuse, prevalence statistics regularly show that women and girls are disproportionately affected by sexual harassment, rape and sexual assault, domestic abuse, stalking, commercial sex sexual exploitation like prostitution and other forms of violence against women and girls. This can include digital violence and abuse, so-called honour-based violence like female genital mutilation and forced marriage. In comparison to men, women's descriptions of abuse indicate a pattern which typically includes tactics of control, humiliation and degradation and the abdication of responsibility of the man and the blame of the woman. Moreover, the impact of violence and abuse is often different for women than it is for men, with over 30% of women affected by domestic abuse reporting experiencing four or more psychological effects, compared to only 8.8% of men. Whatever form it takes, violence against women and girls can have both an immediate and a long-lasting impact. It is quite simply unacceptable for modern day Scotland and does not reflect the country of equality we aspire to become. So the Equally Safe strategy, which was co-produced by a wide range of key experts, stakeholders and partners, is Scotland's strategy to take action against these causes of and all forms of violence against women and girls. Remember our gendered lens? Well, through this strategy and its linked delivery plan, we seek to tackle the violent and abusive behaviour carried out predominantly by men that is predominantly directed at women and girls, precisely because of their gender. It has four priorities. That Scottish society embraces equality and mutual respect and rejects all forms of violence against women and girls. That women and girls thrive as equal citizens, socially, culturally, economically and politically. That interventions are early and effective, preventing violence and maximising the safety and well-being of women, children and young people. And that men desist from all forms of violence against women and girls and perpetrators of such violence receive a robust and effective response. Equally Safe at Work is part of this huge programme of activity, sitting under priority two, women and girls thrive as equal citizens, socially, culturally, economically and politically. And you'll be hearing way more about this exciting pilot in a few minutes. But first, let me outline why being equally safe at work is so important. We've heard that violence against women and girls is caused by the unequal power relations, patriarchal norms and toxic masculinity that damages all genders. This is the root and manifests as unequal economic, social and political power, the objectification of women and unequal distribution of caring responsibilities. So let me give you some examples. In the workplace, women's economic inequality puts them at greater risk of poverty than men. This is due to occupational segregation and women's overrepresentation in lower paid work. Women are paid on average 15% less per hour than men. Twice as, men, twice as many 
female employees receive less than seven pounds per hour than male employees. Access to resources within shared households is often unequal and women are likely to have more caring responsibilities and to work part time. In 2015 to 2018, the relative poverty rate after housing costs was higher for lone mothers at 39% than for other single working age adults. Furthermore, women are also twice as likely to receive social security and are therefore at greater risk of poverty due to welfare reform and austerity. Age is also a factor in sustaining labour market inequality in terms of unequal access to occupational pensions. Two thirds of pensioners living in poverty across the UK are women. There are many more statistics I could talk to you about. But managing poverty can negatively impact the physical and mental health of women. The physical and mental health of mother, mothers, which creates further barriers on the ability to find employment and therefore sustains poverty from both mothers and children. And we know that children living in poverty are more likely to experience poor mental and physical health. This is recognised in Scotland's engagement with the Adverse Childhood Experiences ACES framework. 89% of women experience financial abuse as an aspect of coercive control when experiencing domestic abuse. Violence against women and girls also creates barriers to employment and other economic resources by negatively impacting women's health and well-being. Therefore, there is a need for violence against women and girls and poverty to be addressed collaboratively to ensure that adequate financial support is available for all women experiencing violence against women and girls, as well as recovery services which address the impacts and how these relate to poverty and economic inequality. Women being equally safe in life, in education, in training, in pre-employment, in employment and in retirement is critical to ensure overall well-being, is critical to protect the human rights of women and girls and to ensure our communities, our workplaces and our economy is inclusive and strong. Our councils across Scotland are working on their own policies with Close the Gap who are supporting the Equally Safe at Work pilot. This is groundbreaking and world leading. They're also working on a range of other development uh, and other developments and innovations that feed into delivering the aspirations and ambitions of the Equally Safe strategy. And there's far too many to capture here, but here are some quick highlights. COSLA itself um, is working on reducing barriers to elected office. In 2018, COSLA's president, Councillor Alison Everson, hosted the Achieving Gender Equality in Local Politics Conference. And the conference brought together women in politics and public life who are in a position to help remove barriers to participation. The learning from the conference was progressed by a newly formed nominated cross-party barriers to elected office special interest group and it worked really hard to ensure that efforts to promote equality and diversity in local democracy receive COSLA's full attention the group developed an action plan which focuses on promoting local politics as an opportunity to influence how our communities run, improving terms and conditions for councillors, improving cultures within councils and developing support networks. A recent example of its work was the proposal of parental leave guidance for councillors, which was approved by council leaders for circulation to all Scottish councils for voluntary adoption. This work can be absolutely changing in terms of women being able to be uh, better and more safely represented as councillors in local areas. South Lanarkshire's Council's menopause policy is another example, and it was launched on the 18th of October 2018, World Menopause Day. The aim of the policy and supporting guidance is to make managers aware of menopause related issues and how they can affect their employers. It encourages them to create an environment where women feel confident enough to raise issues about their symptoms and ask for adjustments at work. South Ayrshire Council's special leave policy, Safe Leave, was introduced after the 
after the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill 2018 that makes psychological and coercive control in the home a criminal offence. It was inspired by New Zealand's world leading Victims Protection Bill and the policy supports managers to give victims of domestic violence up to 10 days leave from work separate from annual leave and sick leave entitlements. A similar policy um, assists victims to leave their partners, find new homes and help protect themselves and any dependent children. In 2018, Stirling Council approved plans to give council staff four weeks full paid paternity leave, allowing council workers eligibility to take the leave in the first year of their child's birth or adoption. So there's lots and lots of work going on and there's so much more of this right across our councils. You can see that the only way for councils to play their part in ensuring individuals and communities are equally safe for all is to ensure that the reach of the issue and the impact of violence against women and girls is clearly seen and understood across all policy and practice areas, and that in both strategic and operational terms, our services understand the role they have to play. Now we want to take a deeper dive into looking at equally safe at work and the important part in deliver, delivering the ambitions of the equally safe strategy that it's playing. Great, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Kelsey Smith. I'm the program officer at Close the Gap. Um, as Laura mentioned, um, we are the Scotland's expert policy and advocacy, advocacy organization working on uh, women's labor market equality. Um, and so we work with policymakers, employers, unions, other third sector organizations. Um, and our kind of key focus is to influence and enable action towards tackling the gender pay gap. And so um, I'm just going to give an overview today, I guess, about the links between violence against women in the workplace and um, some of the links between women's labor market inequality and how that links into to violence against women. So to start, um, it's important to look at the kind of key problem about women's labor market inequality and the gender pay gap is the key indicator of that. And so there are three main causes for the gender pay gap, um, and that is occupational segregation, inflexible working and discrimination. Um, and Katie kind of briefly mentioned a bit about occupational segregation, which is essentially the clustering of women in lower paid roles. And that is due to um, stereotypes um, about women's capabilities and skills. So you're seeing women more clustered in roles around um, cleaning, catering, care, um, uh, clerical and admin work. And so um, what you're also finding is that there is a lack of women in senior management roles. And so that's something generally called the glass ceiling. So we're finding that uh, women are clustered in low paid roles and not in those uh, decision making positions. Um, around inflexible working, women are more responsible for care within the family. So that could be around other child care, caring after sick parents, um, or other relatives, disabled people and older people. And so um, there is a lack of quality, flexible working and part-time roles available for women in senior positions. So what you're finding is women are working in those um, as well, lower paid part-time roles. And then finally, discrimination. So um, women are being paid less for work that is either the same or similar value. So um, key discriminations within paying and grading systems. And so examples of that may be that um, men have more access to bonus earning compared to women or that uh, women have less access to say overtime positions or, um, or overtime pay or shift work. Um, and so within this labor market inequality as well, there's a kind of key link to violence against women. So for example, um, young women and women in precarious work are more likely to experience sexual harassment and not report it. Um, and as well, sexist workplace cultures leads to underreporting of all forms of violence against women, especially sexual harassment, where behavior has been normalized. And so we also know that uh, there are similarities within women's experience of the gender pay gap, but there's also um, a number of different differences. And uh, women's experience is going to be dependent on their kind of multiple intersecting identities. So uh, disabled women in some groups of black and minority ethnic women are more likely to be underemployed and unemployed and experience higher pay gaps as well. Disabled um, black minority ethnic women and lesbian, bisexual and trans women report higher levels of discrimination, bullying and harassment. 
Uh, younger women's employment is concentrated on part-time and insecure work. Older women are the sandwich generation of carers. Um, and so they're looking after kind of older partners, but then as well, their grandchildren. And so they're more concentrated in low paid and part-time work to kind of accommodate for their caring responsibilities. And Muslim women face a triple penalty, penalty so being discriminated based on um, race, gender, and faith and religion. So why violence against women happens? Um, I think as Katie mentioned as well, that there are clear indicators in which um, women's inequality in society directly leads into violence against women happening, but it's also that uh, inequality in society also leads to labor market inequality. And so to be able to prevent violence against women, we need to look at where uh, there's kind of different levels of inequality that's happening. And so prevalence of violence against women in Scotland, um, I think the impact of violence against women has been kind of clearly outlined, but some of the kind of key statistics are um, one in three women experience some form of violence against women in their lifetime. One in four women experience domestic abuse in their lifetime. 70% of women have experienced or witnessed sexual harassment. And so that comes from a um, Scotland based survey that found that these experiences of sexual harassment ranged from either unwanted kind of sexual comments to serious sexual assault. And in 2017, 2018, the rape conviction rate was 5%. So I think as we've clearly outlined, it is happening at epidemic levels across Scotland. And so specifically in the workplace, 75% um, of women experiencing domestic abuse are targeted at work. So perpetrators use workplace resources to target victim survivors. So that could be either through using phones, um, emails, turning up the workplace. 80% of women experience sexual harassment will never report it. That's mainly due to fear of being blamed for what has happened, assuming that nothing's going to change if they do report it, being unaware of how the reporting system works, or also fear of repercussions. So uh, worrying that their job may be affected, worrying they may lose their job if they do report sexual harassment, they may not be able to apply for a promotion. So a number of different reasons that are creating barriers for women to report. Um, and we found that there's very few examples of violence against women sensitive employment practice. So, um, for example, in terms of bullying and harassment policies that may exist in, in certain workplaces, there's either minimal to no mention of sexual harassment or no any um, gendered analysis of how kind of bullying and harassment may happen to women specifically. Uh, and then as well, no mention of violence against women anywhere else or there's flexible working um, policies, but not being aware that flexible working can be used as a support mechanism if someone may be experiencing violence against women or help them manage the, um, certain changes that are happening in their life because of violence against women. So there's a huge gap in uh, employment practice around being able to support victim survivors of violence against women. And so we know there's a significant cost to the economy because of violence against women. So it costs the UK economy 77 billion pounds a year. And so that's cost of public services, economic output, uh, reduction in productivity among staff and absent management. So there's significant administrative costs um, due to either unplanned time off, higher employee turnover, um, as well as increased recruitment costs for um, finding new staff for those turnovers. So it makes good business sense to address violence against women in the workplace and to prioritize it. Which leads to equally safe at work. So Close the Gap developed a employer accreditation program um, to support the local Im implementation of the equally safe strategy. And so we have um, been piloting that within seven councils over the past year. And so the councils that we've been working with are Aberdeen City Council, Highland Council, Shetland Island Council, um, Perth and Kinross Council, Midlothian Council, and then North and South Lanarkshire. Um, as well, we have a shadow group of 18 other councils that have been meeting throughout the pilot process to share in the learning from the program. Um, some of the councils applied to participate in the pilot, but uh, we were only able to kind of take a certain amount of councils to work with over the year. So um, we've been able to share in some of the kind of key learning and key progresses from the, from the pilot so far. And so, as we've mentioned, um, preventing violence against women in the workplace also requires addressing gender equality in the workplace. So uh, when we were developing the program, um, we wanted to make sure that we were addressing all these key topics. So we 
developed a, a tiered program of the program. So it's a bronze, silver and gold tier. Um, and councils have to work towards meeting criteria within six key different standards. So the standards are leadership, data, flexible working, occupational segregation, workplace culture and violence against women. And so when we were developing the standards for the program and for the councils to be working towards, we um, worked with a number of key kind of experts on this and consulted with different employers groups and as well as with trade unions on uh, what would be achievable for councils, but also what is um, would work best in a kind of local authority area. So some of the criteria um, councils needed to demonstrate that they were meeting a wide range of different criteria in those six key standards. And so while it was important that there was a violence against women policy, they also needed to have built capacity in line managers to respond to disclosures and ensure that there were support mechanisms in place to also signpost victim survivors too. So um, there is a kind of multitude of different types of criteria that they had to work towards. So uh, for example, there is um, training for line managers, both on violence against women, but also flexible working. So how women can um, benefit from flexible working being available. Uh, awareness raising on violence against women at work. So uh, we developed a number of different kind of posters, leaflets uh, and postcards that were distributed throughout the workplace, um, as well as a number of different events and seminars were held on raising awareness around different types of violence against women that might happen at work and how to report that. Um, policy review and development, so looking at existing equalities policies or also kind of employee codes of conduct to see how they could um, be updated to include a kind of gendered analysis and include more gender equality and violence against women and also development of new policies. So a lot of councils didn't have a violence against women policy in place already. So there was development of that. Addressing occupational segregation. So developing different initiatives to address both horizontal and vertical occupational segregation. So looking at things such as implementing um, women's networks or offering shadowing opportunities for women to follow women in kind of leadership roles to increase women in leadership roles in the organization. Uh, and then collecting employee data. So um, this was around collecting workplace or workforce data um, around kind of recruitment or retention, uh, full-time and part-time staff, having that disaggregated by gender, um, also collecting data on violence against women. So if people were coming forward and reporting, um, if they felt supported through the reporting process, if they felt satisfied by the reporting, um, and then as well, uh, gender pay gap data. So some of our key learnings so far from the program. So we've just been piloting over the past year. So um, all the councils have submitted evidence that they've been meeting the bronze level criteria. And so uh, some of the key learning we've had for that is that there's a number of things that need to be in place for the program to be successful. So that is um, senior leadership buy-in. So uh, from a high level within the organization that senior leaders are discussing this as a priority that violence against women and supporting employees experiencing violence against women and addressing gender equality are seen as um, core to the organization's values. Um, and as well linked to that is that there's a prioritization and allocation of staff time and resource so that uh, staff are given time to actually do the work on this and actually kind of review the policy, implement the policy. And so it's seen as a key priority for the, for the council. Um, as well, collaboration across the organization so that it's not just sitting within the HR department that um, they're working with other groups within the council. So that could be um, working with trade unions, working with uh, comms teams, working with um, learning and development teams to kind of develop training. Um, so making sure that it is a kind of whole council approach to it. So it's not just seen as being led by one department. Another key factor would be um, having an actual kind of interest and in knowledge of the subject. So actually kind of looking at what are the causes of the gender pay gap within the organization? Why is it that women are having increased barriers to uh, progression or development opportunities? And so having that keen interest in it makes it easier to be able to kind of come up with creative solutions to it and also sustainable kind of long-term solutions within the council. Um, and as well, engaging with external expert organizations. So that could be, um, engaging with the local women's aid service. So having kind of clear signposting to that and as well a rate crisis service. So if there are gonna be um, more mechanisms in place to either encourage reporting or support victim survivors and employees that you do have uh, that direct link to those kind of expert support organizations. 
as well, some of the key learning that we have found uh, from the program is that um, the accreditation program has helped push an equalities agenda through the council. And so this has been feedback from some of the um, equally safe at work leads that we've been working with that it's kind of created gender equality as a priority and violence against women as a priority. And you're seeing that more people are wanting to do work on it and it's kind of giving time for people to focus energy on it. It's starting conversations about violence against women as a workplace issue. So um, more and more people are seeing it as something that is relevant to the workplace and it is something that you can talk to your line manager about and it's not something that um, isn't relevant to the workplace. And as well, that line managers are starting to feel more comfortable um, approaching their staff if they see kind of recognize the signs that they may be experiencing um, a form of violence against women. So there's a bit more awareness about employees' role in supporting employees that are maybe experiencing violence against women. Um, and as well as it's starting conversations around key elements of gender equality. So one of the councils we work with shared that uh, it's the first time they've heard people within the council talking about occupational segregation. So it's kind of highlighting some of these key issues and getting uh, conversation started around it. Um, as well, we've learned that there's been increased engagement throughout the council. So uh, more departments are trying to see how this is relevant to them, increase awareness in, within their department, um, share learning. So we've had people attend some of our line managers training and they'll take it back to their team and, and share what they can do as a team to address some of these issues, um, as well as engagement from elected members that we've had through the process. And it has inevitably introduced new training policies and procedures to the, into the council. So as I mentioned, a development of a violence against women policy, um, we've seen as well a lot of the councils introducing um, special leave for domestic abuse as well, um, new training on equalities and flexible working. So it's brought in a lot of new different or even updated different kind of training and policies and practices within, within the councils. So the next step is that uh, we are in the process of doing an evaluation of the effectiveness of the program. So looking at um, whether or not the accreditation program has been a effective mechanism for engaging with councils to do work on gender equality and violence against women. So um, we have uh, an employee survey um, and we've been doing a number of different employee focus groups to speak with employees about their experience of working in the council and if they've been aware of what the work's been going on over the past year. So we'll be developing a larger evaluation of the program um, and then looking to roll out the program to the remaining councils. And so that is... Thank you very much, Kelsey and Katie. Um, we're now gonna open up to questions from the audience and my colleague Lynn um, will be reading those out for us. Okay, so we've just got one. Um, what were some of the challenges in, of implementing the pilot? Um, so some of the challenges I think kind of are relevant to also the kind of key factors for success. So um, some of the challenges were around prioritization and leadership um, around equally safe at work, but also gender equality and violence against women. So making sure that staff were getting time to work on this and that uh, senior managers and chief execs were buying into the work on it. Um, other challenges were uh, just awareness of the kind of key topics. So we did a lot of work with um, line managers and employees around violence against women and gender equality and trying to frame it as a, as a workplace issue and that it was relevant to the workplace. So I think there's a gap and continues to be a gap in awareness among staff around the kind of key issues. Um, as well, communication to staff. So one of the key things we wanted from the program was that any changes that were being made were being filtered down to all levels of staff. And I think what we found is um, there's still challenges within that, especially with staff who are uh, non-PC based to make sure that they're accessing uh, the information that the council are putting out about either events to do with kind of 16 days of action or any of the awareness raising campaigns. So there's still kind of some challenges around that. Um, and I think what we found was uh, the program was, is quite robust and does have a lot of criteria and um, 
about being able to get all of that done within the one year pilot period, I think was a significant challenge because it did require quite a lot of work. And uh, within some councils, they had more than one person working on it. But with councils that just had one person, I think there was um, a lot of pressure to get a lot of work done for them. So yeah, that was, those were some of the challenges for the program. Okay, so we've got a couple more in. Um, how engaged are elected members with issues around violence against women and girls, and how does that impact the success of initiatives? Well, I can answer some of that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, COSLA is uh, the co-governance body for Equally Safe and indeed the co-owner for Equally Safe. Um, and therefore, in relation to implementation um, across local areas, COSLA's Community Wellbeing Board um, hold uh, the um, job, the duty of providing that governance. So essentially, um, on a regular basis um, across the year, that board will come together. The board has representatives from every single local authority that sit in it. Um, and Equally Safe is one of the priority uh, policy areas that uh, they look at. Um, so understanding violence against women and girls, understanding how it impacts on communities, understanding all of the different complexities around uh, the, the roots um, and uh, the causes, and also how then that impacts organisationally and what the responsibilities are for local authorities as well as other public sector bodies. All of that is discussed every single time they meet. <laughs> so at that, at that level, we know that um, elected members um, are very, very engaged. What, what I know um, since um, we've been really actively working on this over the past uh, year and a half, when the, the role that I'm currently in is was created, is that giving that a focus at our board meetings ensures actually that elected members um, across local areas are also um, more engaged and more linked up with the work that is going on to promote this agenda. We know that elected members um, and senior officers will reach out to Violence Against Women and Girl partnerships more often in order to get more information through which they can maintain uh, the level of knowledge and information that their elected members sitting on the board require to have. So uh, at, at that level, um, there is definitely traction. Um, I think that can improve. Obviously, we want every single elected member to have a, a, a huge commitment to and an understanding of this issue and understanding how it's critical centrally within the context of creating safer, stronger communities. Um, and that's what we're working to do. That's great, thanks. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the next steps, um, mostly focused on the rollout of the pilot to the remaining councils. So um, you've mentioned rolling out the pilot to the remaining councils. Would you consider including health boards or a partnership approach to support community planning partnerships? Um, and then a kind of question around time skills. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so this has come up quite a bit and came up as well um, right at the beginning when we were piloting about whether or not we would consider um, joint approaches with health boards or not. Um, and so for the time being, we are just rolling out to local authorities. Um, I know with one of the councils that we did work with that um, they did a lot of work with the Violence Against Women Partnership, who also is based in the NHS board. So there was a lot of sharing between some of the developments that were being done in the council and then uh, with the health board. So at the time being, we're just going to be looking at councils for the larger role in the future, but we'll be looking to see how we can kind of roll it out to other public sector bodies in the distant future, I guess. Um, and in terms of time scales, um, so our evaluation of the program is, um, until March, and so then we'll be looking for um, continued Scottish government funding to then roll it out larger in the future. So we don't have any kind of concrete timescales for when that will be, but we are will be kind of keeping our shadow group councils who are kind of first in line to being able to um, put themselves forward for the larger rollout. So we'll be providing that update when we are clear of what the next steps are, what time frame that will be. 
That's great, thanks. There's still time um, for more questions. If anyone has them, just use the questions tab within the webinar software. So, um, have you or are you going to involve um, women's aid organisation? Um, so, we've been linked up with um, Scottish Women's Aid through the development of the pilot and also the development of a lot of our resources for councils throughout it. So in our, say, for example, our line manager's guidance on violence against women and work, um, we consulted with a number of different violence against women experts, including uh, Scottish Women's Aid. Um, as well, we've ensured as one of our kind of criteria that councils are engaging with those external organizations. So, for example, local women's aid groups. Um, and we have been working with um, the Scottish Women's Aid on the development of the Equally Safe in Practice, so the Violence Against Women training. So that is something that we've kind of connected up about uh, potential for rolling that out with some of our pilot councils. So there's been a lot of different kind of links up with uh, Women's Aid groups throughout the throughout the pilot process, but within our kind of pilot councils and their local groups. So it's something that we are considerate of. Thank you. Um, what level have councils reached? Have any reached bronze? So um, all the councils have just submitted their evidence to be assessed for whether or not they've reached bronze accreditation. So we're just in the kind of assessment stage of all their evidence for all the criteria. So um, we don't know just yet, but we'll be obviously updating them first and then over the next couple months, they'll come out who has met the accreditation. Will the evaluation be shared? Will the learning be shared widely, um, perhaps for another webinar? Um, we are planning on holding um, an evaluation uh, event. So we'll be sharing the kind of key learning from our evaluation and from the pilot, um, which will hopefully be taking place in March. Um, and then I think we could be open to a potential for a webinar on, <laughs> on the evaluation and some of the other kind of key learning from the program. So open for that. So we've had a question about, um, does the VOL work address the issues regarding women that don't speak English and as such find it hard to come forward? So does the program address that? Is that it says um VAW address, so I don't know if um if it's just a wider question, if there's work or if it's about the accreditation. Um, within our program, we've looked at uh, how, I guess, in, in certain forms of violence against women, that women may be prevented from coming forward reporting due to language restrictions or that their partner may be holding them back from learning English and what that means. So um, we've not done any specific work on that, but it is something that we've kind of considered within our work. I think um, within the context of the strategy and the delivery plan, obviously um, the greater risk of violence to women who live lives with interse uh, in intersection, intersectional um, uh, intersectionalities in relation to those risks being higher um, is something the strategy really sought to capture and to work on. And I think um, there are a number of key partners involved uh, at a strategic level and um, within the context of the National Delivery Group who bring huge expertise in relation to this um, area. Um, I think we have a lot more work to do, everybody. I think the strategy itself at the moment um, with uh, the best of intentions is uh, not making massive changes in, in relation to women who face additional barriers. Um, including the barriers that you're talking about. 
I think this is fundamental within the context of uh, safer, strengthening communities. And there will be um, lots of discussions about how all of our partners can sit down and do better. I have to say one of, if I, if I give an example of something which I think is highly positive, um, with the um, Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act has been supported by um, a whole range of different sorts of training for people, particularly um, professionals within the justice sector. Um, and um, Safe Lives um, work with Police Scotland to develop the training that um, many, many thousands of police personnel have undergone now and are continuing to undergo in order to develop their knowledge and understanding of domestic abuse and coercive controlling behaviour. And part of that focus um, in terms of that training and development um, is uh, on ensuring women who face those additional barriers to being able to uh, find ways to come forward and to receive proper and appropriate support. Um, uh, that's certainly something that is very much looked at. Um, I've been involved in some of those sessions. It's created massive discussion and engagement um, with uh, officers who've undertaken that training. And I'm very positive and hopeful that we can continue to roll out and develop more and more and more engagement that really start to open minds and open doors to ensure that those who are at the moment less well seen within the context of how things are rolling out and less well supported actually um, we start to make some um, real change happen for those women and girls and children. That's great, thank you. Um, will the evaluation event be open to anyone to attend? Can participants of the webinar attend, of this webinar attend? Um, I don't see why not. We haven't we haven't started planning the event just yet or the attendance list, so I think we're open to uh, any kind of key stakeholders or anyone who would benefit from learning from the program. So, as well, if we do do a webinar, then that will be open to all as well. Um, can I ask what types of evidence has been submitted from local authorities? So could you give some examples? So around what evidence has been submitted, um, so the way the program has been designed is that uh, for each of the standards, there's the criteria. And so for each of the pieces of criteria, so um, it could say like, uh, there's been a leadership statement sent to all staff um, signed by the chief executive um, about equally safe at work and uh, what the council is going to be doing and the commitment to the council. So things like that. So um, they then need to demonstrate that they've met all those different criteria. And so either they provide a description of what they've done for that. So if it's um, awareness raising event on the link between labor market inequality and violence against women. So they'll either provide like a description of what they've done to meet that criteria or also submit um, kind of evidence of, to show that they've met the criteria. So that generally has been things such as um, their updated equalities policy or um, updated code of conduct or their new violence against women policy or um, they've submitted their equal pay statements and occupational segregation data, um, gender pay gap data, so it's it's kind of a diverse mix of things that they need to demonstrate that they've done to meet the bronze tier. So it's kind of a wide ranging set of evidence that we've seen. So, and it's specifically just around how they are explaining they've met the criteria. So I think there's around um, 52 different criteria across the six standards. So it's been quite a bit of work over the past year. So it's just around how they can demonstrate that they've met all those 52 standards. Do criteria. Thank you. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. So if you have any more burning questions, please um, submit them now, um, or you can get in touch with the presenters afterwards. Um, so do you feel like the accreditation program is the way to go with tackling violence against women and gender inequality in the workplace? Mm -hmm. 
So I think that has been one of the um, key reasons why we developed Equally Safe at Work was to um, assess whether or not an accreditation program was a effective mechanism. Because um, I think following the introduction of the public sector equality duty, which it was assumed that that would create a sort of transformational change within public sector, um, which didn't. Uh, so it was, I think there's been a lot of questions around what is the best way to engage with employers on these equalities issues and on uh, then as well violence against women. So that has been kind of one of our key uh, outcomes for for the program. So we're going to be looking at that a kind of in more depth as part of our evaluation process. But I think what we've learned early on that um, it has been effective for um, engaging with councils on these key issues and also supporting them through some of this work and kind of creating a bit more of a, I guess, pres prescriptive approach to best practice on occupational segregation or workplace culture or data. So I think we're finding that it has been effective in, in certain ways, but uh, we'll kind of explore that a bit more in our evaluation once we have kind of some of the more uh, qualitative and quantitative data that we can kind of assess against that. Thank you. Um, can we get copies of the slides from today's webinar? Uh, yeah, they'll all be available. Um, and also the webinar itself has been recorded. So that will be available for you um, and also for you to share with your um, colleagues and networks as well. And we'll be sharing that um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. Um, are there any more questions, Lynn? No. Okay, so um, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, thanks to you all for joining us and for your questions. And thank you to Kelsey and Katie for your input. Um, so as I said, the recorded version of this webinar will be available and we'll be promoting that um, via our networks in the coming days. Um, and we're also organizing our next webinar in the primary prevention series and we'll share details of that um, with our networks and on social media. Um, in the coming weeks as well. Um, but thank you again, Kelsey and Katie, um, and thank you all for joining us.